Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. As always, I hope you had a great week. And you can always find Let's Talk Micro on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Good Pods, whatever you listen to podcasts, you can find Let's Talk Micro. As far as social media, I am on Instagram as Let's Talk Micro, no apostrophe, on Twitter as Let's Talk Micro 1, on TikTok and YouTube as Let's Talk Micro, and on LinkedIn as Luis Plaza. So please go ahead and subscribe to the podcast, download episodes, leave a review if the app allows you to do so. And if you want to leave any feedback, you can do that via social media, or you can email me at letstalkmicro at outlook.com. As always, any feedback, any suggestions, they are always welcome and appreciated. And if you haven't checked out the previous episode of Let's Talk Micro, please go ahead and do so. It was a great episode about Piperacillin, Tazobactam, or TZP. It was a great episode with Dr. Romney Humphrey and Dr. April Abbott. They came to the podcast and they talked about a study where they compare automated systems, you know, like the Vitec, your uh, Microscan, your Phoenix. They compare Piperacillin, Tazobactam results to a reference method, which is a broth micro dilution. So they discuss the results, how did the instruments perform? They talk about breakpoints, you know, the difference between FDA breakpoints and CLSI breakpoints. So overall, it was a very interesting episode, very informative. You know, they talked about something that I wasn't aware of before, but definitely, you know, made me look more and, and, and learn more. And they talked about the Merino trial. And how, um, you know, Piperacillin, Tesobactam perform against, you know, uh, carbapenems. So definitely, if you haven't checked it out, go ahead and do so. Great episode. Very informative. So today's episode is part one of two episodes. And in this episode, Dr. Christina Wujewoda from the University of Vermont Medical Center. She's the director of clinical microbiology there. So she comes to the podcast to talk about her, quote, horror story of how the, you know, the network system at the hospital went down. And as laboratorians, you know, we definitely, we identify with downtimes, right? In the lab, you know, we experience sometimes, you know, uh, a four hour downtime, maybe, you know, six, eight hours. So we might be familiar with this, but this is definitely a story that you want to hear. So this is the network system. So everything from the LIS through email. So everything went down. So definitely, you know, she's the director of clinical microbiology. So she's going to talk in the podcast about the experience from the lab, you know, point of view. How did they manage, you know, from entering, you know, manually writing results to communicating those results, all the things, you know, that sometimes, you know, we don't, because of technology, we really don't keep in mind, like, you know, like reference ranges and stuff like that. So what kind of measures they took to make sure that those results properly went out there. And also, you know, she definitely, she talks about how long this downtime was. It was definitely a long time. So definitely, I think the, the take lesson from this is that th those of us that work in a hospital and lab, we need to be prepared for things like this. So I definitely enjoyed talking to Dr. Wujawoda. It was a great episode, very informative. So let's go ahead and listen to it. So as you know, technology is definitely a big part of our lives, and that translates to the lab as well. From laboratory information systems to more instruments, you know, technology has made our lives easier. You know, we are able to accommodate more volume. So what happens when something goes wrong with technology? So I was at a conference listening to a great presentation, and today with me, I have Dr. Christina Wujiwara, to talk about this. Dr. Wojewoda, welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Christy Wojewoda. I'm the director of the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory at the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, and I'm currently an associate professor at the University of Vermont. Definitely a pleasure having you. So we'll go ahead and we'll break it down, uh, you know, step by step for the audience. So let's go ahead and start with what kind of hospital you work in? Sure. Um, so the University of Vermont Medical Center is uh, an academic tertiary care medical center. Um, we've got 620 beds. Um, we're a level one trauma center. 
Um, we're associated with a college of medicine, so we have a lot of trainees. Um, and the, the laboratory here not only takes care of um, our own patients, inpatient and outpatient volume, um, but we're also a network of seven hospitals and laboratories. And in addition, we serve as a reference laboratory um, to 17 um, local hospitals um, uh, around the area in Vermont, New Hampshire, and New York. Okay, so you definitely have you know, quite a few hospitals. Okay, it's kind of like what my uh, my place too. Okay, so all of us, those of us that work in the lab, we're definitely familiar with downtime. You know, we have different types. So can you talk about that? Yeah, so prior to um, the experience that we're going to talk about, we had some scheduled downtimes. Um, oftentimes, these were for uh, system upgrades or maintenance. Um, you know, at most, they would last six hours. Um, we were fairly used to using paper requisitions and, and sheltering in place in those, in, in those instances. Every once in a while, we would have an unplanned downtime. Um, you know, something went uh, funky with the LIS um, or there was a connectivity issue. And those never really lasted more than 24 to 48 hours. And pretty quickly, um, we were usually made aware of what the issue was and the progress on, on how it was getting fixed. And again, in those instances, usually we switched to paper and just only dealt with um, uh, stat samples or critical samples like positive blood cultures and everything else just waited until the system came back up. Yes. And, you know, once the audience listens to this story, they're definitely um, going to see because, yeah, um, us, you know, especially me, I've been through like one hour, four hours, and a lot of times they happen during the night shift. And typically they, you know, they send the stat samples. And like you mentioned, anything that's stat, they send it. And then the more routine stuff, it kind of holds on. Once the system comes back up, everyone receives, we'll go ahead and put it through the system and process it. So definitely nothing too long. And you mentioned maybe in your case, maybe 24 to 48 hours, but nothing like what we're going to talk about. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about this, this downtime. You know, when did it start and when did you notice, you know, that something was wrong? Sure. So, um uh, the, the date is, is, is burned in my head, um, Wednesday, October 28th, 2020. Um, we first started noticing um, some connectivity issues. So if you remember where you were in October of 2020, um, we were in our first COVID fall um, and things here were all virtual. So I was an attempting, uh, attempting to log on to an infection prevention meeting and Many, many people just couldn't couldn't log on or we would get on and then we would get kicked off. Um, just thought it was an internet issue um, and we canceled the meeting. Then we started noticing that email seemed slow, um, regular internet seemed slow, and then eventually um, our laboratory information system, um, which we use Epic Beaker, um, seemed to get slow and then eventually started to freeze for different people at different times. So that first afternoon, we thought, well, something's going on with the system. We didn't know where in the system, but just the system. And so um, figured, well, let's just switch to downtime procedures, only work on critical samples um, and stat samples, um, and we'll catch up in the morning when the system should be up. Okay. Um, yeah. And those of you in the audience, we definitely remember those times. Yeah. That was just, it was definitely you know, challenging. And we said to go to meetings, everything was happening through like teams and stuff like that. So definitely a lot of online, you know, the press, the online presence was very strong. Okay. So then you said, you know, right. We'll take care of it in the morning. So what happens in the morning, you know, so basically day one and then day two. Yeah. So, um, got in in the morning, still wasn't up. And we didn't realize it at the time, but our um, email um, wasn't working as appropriate. We thought we were sending things, but things weren't being sent. Um, and emails to us were never received. And so there was really quite little information about what was going on at this time. We, we tried to just handle 
um, you know, stat things. Um, we were starting to figure out that um, something didn't seem right overall, that it might be a bigger issue. Um, there was an email that, that came out from the president of the hospital that this could potentially be a cyber attack, but it, it didn't reach most of us. Um, and at this point, we we're starting to realize that um, a lot of our other systems, phones in, within the hospital and faxes within the hospital were networked. And um, if they were on the network, then they weren't working either. They had to be hardwired. Same thing with printers. Um, if a printer was networked, it wasn't working. It had to be hardwired to a computer. Um, so at this point, we, um, we started talking within our small groups. We started having a lot of meetings and trying to at least figure out how we're gonna you know, get through this day's work. That's all we, we knew um, at, at that point. We learned later um, that it was actually our cybersecurity team that shut the system down. They had noticed something, I'm using air quotes now, funny, um, uh, on Wednesday, that first day. Uh, and in order to make sure that the perpetrators didn't get access to anything more, they were the ones that shut the whole system down, which um, in hindsight was, was great because to our knowledge, no patient information ever got out. Okay, so so they they shut it down, and then um, so then you mentioned the you know, communication, how it's affected, you know, fax, you know, email, phones. So then, at this time, you know, you remember from the presentation, you start talking about a survival strat strategy. So what was done? Great question. So um, at this point, um, we realized we couldn't keep up with the amount of samples that were coming to us, especially. Um, using downtime procedures. And so um, we started working with our uh, network partners um, to start sending things out. So once things were in our hands, um, we were kind of stuck with them. Our reference laboratory shut down the interface with them. Um, and so if we wanted to send something to a reference laboratory, we had to handwrite a requisition. So it was extra work on our part. So we worked with our network um, laboratories and the laboratories that send us for us reference work and asked them to send out as much as possible. We started realizing that specimens were timing out or expiring um, with us just holding on to them. So we tried to run the oldest things or the, the specimens that um, were going to expire um, and at least get paper results. We wound up closing some phlebotomy stations. Um, it was at this point we, we realized that we were filing our pa uh, paper patient results based on day of service. Because um, at that point it made sense that uh, for billing purposes, you would need to know the day of service. Um, but early on, we realized, well, if a provider calls for a result, they don't know the day of service. And as it, especially as this downtime went out longer, um, we really needed to be able to access patient results better. So we wound up switching our filing system to uh, alphabetical order by patient name. And then we, um, one of the best things we did was we instituted a bouncer um, at, at the door of the laboratory. Um, this was twofold. Uh, one, we realized as soon as we had a sample in our hands, it was our problem. And if we didn't have all patients, if we didn't have two patient identifiers, if we didn't have an ordering provider, if we didn't have a patient location, we were stuck with that information and unable to get it out to the, the person that needed it. And so we put a, a bouncer at the door to review um, at least everything coming from within our own four walls. They reviewed the requisition to make sure that all of that crucial information that usually comes to us electronically um, was on that handwritten re requisition. The other thing the bouncer helped with was um, there were many well-meaning medical students, residents, um, who I'm sure was, were told by their attending physician who was old school to just go down to the lab and get the results. Um, but as we were going through, we needed every ounce of energy and every ounce of focus to be on 
all of the patient results and manual um, result entry that we were doing. Um, we were physically handwriting results for all of our cultures and all, all of our culture workups. Um, we can talk about um, some some COVID testing issues uh, in a bit, but um, we couldn't have anybody interrupting our workflow. And so having that bouncer there, was we were able to redirect um, those uh, caregivers to the area where we were storing all of the laboratory results. Um, so that was something that we thought of relatively early on that really, really helped us um, really focus on the patient testing that we needed to. Wow, this, yeah, I can can't even imagine that kind of, you know, that happening. It's just, we definitely, you know, sometimes, you know, it's even difficult, right? We're so used to that. Someone calls with the results and you just say, okay, what's the medical record number something? We type that in, we retrieve that result. And even then sometimes, you know, might be a little bit challenging sifting through stuff, but they're, you know, like you said, it's just when some, someone go in and then you're storing this results. So going through those papers and finding, because there's no way to electronically find the you know the patient's information so you have to sift through this so that's very time consuming and you know good so with the bouncer yeah because like you said you know the, those forms if just something is incomplete then that will add for you to try and to track that down and even with the system you know when sometimes something is not order we spend a lot of time you know or calling a result something as simple as that you can't get out of someone oh i'll call you back they never do so you have all these challenges with technology so Without, without it, it's just, you know, it's terrible. So, so you, you well, and, mm -hmm. oh, Go ahead. I was just going to say, and you know, um, current state, the order location is OR4, but by the time we have a culture result to give to somebody, they're out of the OR <laughs> and, and we had no way of actually tracking them down in the hospital because there, there wasn't a system, uh, to know what bed they got placed in. And so, um, we would have to call different floors to see if the patient was there in order to get the result to where it needed to go. Yeah. And even, you know, with the system up and running, that's, that's challenging when you have a patient from the OR and by the time you get the results, like you said, yeah, sometimes, you know, you have that result and it takes you a long time to finally call it and get someone to take it. So a lot of challenges. So, and then you, so you talked about that they were organized by day of service. Is there anything else about this or this is just the way that is state um so we started out uh, in the first couple of days uh, lumping all of the results based on the day of testing um we quickly figured out that that wasn't going to be sustainable it's not easy to look up res results by a patient name in that fashion um so we had rows and rows we filled a conference room with um file drawers we were hand labeling um, folders with patient names. It would, we would think that people would follow one convention of last name first, first name last, but that, that didn't always happen. And so that added a level of confusion. Um, birth dates weren't always fully handwritten out or, or legibly handwritten out. So making sure that we really had the correct patient um, to put that, um, a correct patient folder to put that result in um, was was difficult, and we all got very refamiliarized with our alphabets um, and in filing results and in looking up patient results. Wow. Okay. So um, so the now so the, you know this continues, and then I'm gonna ask now and for the audience. Yes, you know you're hearing correct. So you know we're going through the timeline. So. Can you talk about, so around day seven, yes, I said seven, and then 14, yes. So what happened during that time frame? So I think we learned a lot within the laboratory. We are process people. Um, we are quality people. And so um, the biggest piece for me as a clinical microbiology director in a pandemic was um, the number of COVID results. So I always say that it would have been so much easier if all of our instrumentation went down because then we couldn't test. Our instrumentation was running fine. We just couldn't get results out. We were able to generate all of the results we normally would. And so by day three, um, 
I said we were constipated with results. We had thousands of COVID results that were in batches. Off, we used we, um, one of our methods was the Hologic Panther at the time um, that were all run on the Hologic Panthers, and I didn't have a way to get them into it, an individual patient result. So um, that first weekend, I just sat and hand wrote hundreds of COVID results, and you don't think about it at the time, but all of those little regulatory requirements about um, what was your reference range, uh, what was the uh, address of the laboratory and the CLIA number of the laboratory in which these are tested in, um, all of that kind of stuff, we, we kind of improved as we went along. But it, it felt like things were changing minute by, by minute, hour by hour. We would think, oh, yes, we need to add the reference range. Oh, we needed to add this. Um, eventually, we were able to get one of our IT gurus to help us take that batch data um, off the whole logic turn it into a spreadsheet format so that we could then use a mail merge um, essentially to make um, to put all of those um, results into a word template document um, and those then those results had to be faxed out um, so uh, old school faxes were brought in um, for anybody within um, our hospital four walls if their fax machine didn't work we had runners um, that put on half marathons worth of, of steps in a day, picking up results, dropping them off at the floors, picking up samples, bringing them back down to the laboratory. Um, we realized that staffing was not enough. And so we wound up bringing in more staffing because it took more hands to do the same amount of work. Um, and then we started having um, what we called orphan results. We had we had results that started pre downtime and on the plates, all we had was a name and an accession number. Well, an accession number means nothing unless you have a system to decode that. Um, and so we just wound up holding on to those results, hoping that somebody would call for them. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't, which was pretty disheartening <laughs> um, if, you, if you think about all the work that we put into those. Um, and then, um, more and more than um, the providers calling for results multiple times um, really became a burden. Um, and it came to realize that uh, the result would go to the floors and a, somebody would walk away with it thinking that it was theirs rather than making sure that, that it stayed with the, the chart. We had a, a lot of paper. Um, uh, a, we repurposed a lot of people. So um, a, a lot of radiology staff really rely on technology. And, and so radiology was pretty close to shut down. And we, we repurposed those staff to help us with the filing and faxing and polling of patient results. Um, and we wound up communicating within our laboratory group using WhatsApp. Um, I'm not promoting WhatsApp. It was just the, the modality that we were able to utilize to at least within um, the pathologist group, um, get communication across. We, we did a pretty good job of tweaking things as we went, as I said, um, something that um, I think was pretty novel. We had our CLIA director at the time go on patient safety rounds and see what was happening on the floors. Um, they were they were not as well off as we were in the laboratory. Um, we we were able to um, kind of lock down our processes pretty quickly within that first week, um, and then just tweak them little by little. Um, but the the clinical staff had a much harder time with that, and so we were able to see where there were issues where the laboratory could help. Um, you know, things you don't think of when you have a system are your reflex tests. So I knew that we, we couldn't do a urinalysis with the reflex to culture anymore. Um, so we would just start getting many more culture orders. But what I forgot about was um, HPV uh, reflexing on PAPS. And so um, that was something that that we missed um, and we had to um, send letters to some providers and patients, letting them know that, that 
we weren't able to do HPV testing on their samples and that they would need to be recollected at no charge if, um, if they needed that result. Um, so there were, there were some things that definitely slipped through the cracks. Yeah, that's a, you, know, the, the, you mentioned the reflex testing. Yeah, because you don't have a system. There's no way to, yeah. Like, especially, you know, with those like, you know, like urines and your analysis that they reflect through cultures and, wow. And then, my dear audience, it's the end of part one of this two episodes. As always, I enjoy sharing this information with you. So on the next episode, it will be the conclusion of how when you know the system starts coming back up and all the things that they did. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading episodes. Thank you for your support. And definitely always make sure that you, know, you work in the lab. Make sure you have some sort of backup plan. And, you know, review it periodically to make sure that if you find yourselves in a situation like this, you can manage properly. So part two next week. As always, continue bringing that passion to what you do. It's so important. We do such great work. So stay motivated. Stay safe. And of course... Continue talking micro. Until the next time. Bye.